Welcome to Exploring the Question, brought to you by the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. I'm your host, Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Foundation. In today's episode, as in our previous episode, we want to inquire into whether the bipartisan search for common ground for the greater good can again thrive, or is it in critical condition and in need of life support? Whether deliberating in Washington, D.C. or our state capitals or local town halls, Americans are increasingly pessimistic about our democracy's ability to function and get things done in the public interest, especially when it comes to you know, tough issues, tough topics like COVID, uh, immigration reform, campus free speech, relations with China. It seems we rarely get around to solving our nation's most pressing issues in a sustainable bipartisan manner. Well, to explore the state of our democracy and our institutions, I am joined by Jason Gramey, the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Jason is that rare individual these days who's respected on both sides of the aisle. He challenges the conventional view of gridlock in an effort to improve our government and public policy. Thanks so much for joining me today, Jason. Please, always a pleasure. Well, let's start with what Aristotle referred to as our most precious possession as a citizen, the respect we've earned, the reputation, the ethos we enjoy in our community. Jason, in today's hyper-partisan political climate, how does one earn the respect of both Democrats and Republicans? Well, I think I look at it as a, uh, it is a fundamental and fair question, because at the base of all complicated human interaction is trust. And I think what we have sought to do over the years is to, you know, lead with our evidence and to, you know, also have a kind of, you know, political empathy for what members of Congress are going through. I think, you know, the secret sauce of the Bipartisan Policy Center is combining, you know, kind of rigorous analytics with, you know, aggressive strategy. I think that unless you understand that members of Congress are basically very good people dealing with very bad incentives, you're not having an honest conversation. You know, all of our peers who just want Congress to be courageous, what, what you're basically asking is members of Congress to do things in the national interest that will undermine their reelection. And while members of Congress will do that sometimes, they won't do that too many times, or they will, in fact, wind up um, not being reelected. And so I think what we bring to the process is kind of a um, radical realism that has earned us, I think, some respect on both sides of the aisle. So, how do you answer the question? Uh, well, the criticism, really, you and I both get it, that working toward compromise in the middle is just for squishes who don't have any real principles. So, you know, it, it's ironic that um, those who are kind of courageously trying to overcome difference are somehow described as lacking in, in moral fiber, when in fact the exact opposite is true. It is not difficult to live on the edges of our political system. It does not require any particular courage to go along with you know, the party line and jump on easy fundraising and go on CNBC and Newsmax. Like, that's easy. It takes tremendous guts in this current environment to actually be willing to try to help govern a divided country. And we're not suggesting that it is easy. It's pretty rough out there. This week uh, certainly reveals that. Um, but at some point you have to say, well, what's the alternative? We have a divided country. We do not believe that makes us ungovernable. And I think until there is, I think, the willingness of some more members, not a lot more, but some more members to actually prioritize those national interests and do it in a way that is consistent with their political interests, we'll continue to have this very inefficient process. I think you're hitting at my, my next question, answer to it anyway. When we're talking about the need to revive bipartisanship, are we talking about more than just politics? I mean, don't you get the feeling that we're talking about the broader culture as a source of many challenges and opportunities today? Sure, yes, sure. So our, you know, our political divisions are an expression of the frayed social fabric upon which our political system rests. I think that it is kind of easy and convenient to say, oh, well, you know, the country's this wonderful place, but boy, you know, that snake pit of Washington. Um, and, you know, again, members of Congress are people pleasers. They are rationally responding to the incentives that the democratic process gives them. You know, we can talk about some of the ways to reform that process so that it is not just the most rigid, egregious incentives that actually drive the discussion. I think the way we elect our officials has a lot to do with that. Um, but you know, ultimately, 
it's simply not going to work to say, can't we all get together, right? The history of this country is not 200 years of placid cohesion. What we've been able to do from time to time is overcome serious difference. And you know, that's really what we need as a country. We do not need Congress to work together all the time. Our Congress was designed to make policy making really difficult. But it's got to work, you know, a few times a year. And we've seen some examples of that. And I think some, you know, potential really derailments of that just in the last couple of weeks. You know, we have a lot of young people who are watching and listening. And so I want to ask you, were you, Jason, always a reconciler? Is, is it just in your nature, yeah, your disposition to bring people together who disagree with one another because of your birth order or something? Yeah, or you know, or did you yeah. have a... Did you have a road to Damascus kind of yeah. experience that inspired you to learn the skills of reconciling the competing values in our democracy? So, like, Lise, I, I like that you go deep, right? Because I think, again, what we are experiencing in Washington is a fundamental expression of who we are as a society and individuals. I was a middle child, no question at all. This has been kind of who I am for just about, you know, well, I, I wasn't a middle child until, you know, two years after my birth, but so for 52 of my 54 years, been a middle child. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is certainly, you know, in my character, if there was an experience that um, reinforced that kind of in public life, I did a lot of um, parliamentary debate in college, right? This is the debate where you get a topic and you get 10 minutes and you have to stand up and make a speech, you know, supporting or opposing a proposition. And the experience of realizing that I could passionately support or oppose almost any idea created a certain amount of you know, political empathy. You know, in my experience, I've never met anybody who's 100% wrong. I've met people who are like 85% wrong, which is really, really, really wrong. But there is always that little you know, glimmer of possibility that provides, I think, the potential for a different kind of discussion. And so I think it, you know, it was that debate experience that really kind of refined that for me in a more kind of public space. And uh, as I recall, that experience would have been at Brown, right? Brown University? Yes, yes it was. I got to ask you, did you ever take any courses from uh, Gordon Wood? Uh, I did not actually take courses from Gordon Wood, but I certainly was uh, aware of his uh, accomplishments and reputation. Well, as you grapple with the competing values around an issue, say like immigration policy, how do, how do you steer both sides to achieve principled compromise? I emphasize the word principled because I'm not talking about cheap compromise that occurs over procedural issues or buying you know, one side off by throwing a billion dollars at them to get them to sign a bill. Give us an example of what principled compromise looks like. So, you know, let's we can start with immigration, which is probably fairly one of the hardest places to start. Just as a kind of entry point to reaffirm what you're suggesting, in our experience, you need centrists to close the deal, but real compromise very rarely starts in the middle. It usually starts on the 20 or 30 yard lines with people who have just a depth of credibility in their own party, addressing what I think you, you know, referred to earlier as that kind of ambivalence about the, you know, the mushy middle. When it comes to immigration reform or housing policy or voting rights, you know, one of the more uplifting realizations that we've had are you know, people are complicated. You know, we've never met a conservative who actually is in lockstep with every single aspect of a conservative agenda or a progressive. And so you know, one of the things that we do is look for you know who are those disruptive members you know people who have a real kind of depth of credibility within their own party and on a particular issue are you know interested in driving a different kind of discussion. Um, we also think that democracy is a momentum sport, and so you know at this moment in immigration reform, it's just not viable to come forward with a comprehensive immigration reform plan. But what we see at the moment is that there is an opportunity around reforming legal immigration. So the you know, issue about how one addresses the 13 million undocumented you know, folks in this country is a couple steps off. But opportunities to figure out how we make our legal system more consonant with our economic interests. You know, the US has a very family-based immigration-centric system. Other countries tend to focus more on the skills that people are bringing to the country. You know, that's an idea that has some resonance 
across the aisle. And so, you know, we have done work you know, on those kinds of issues, trying to rebuild that discussion. But I'll give you another issue on an issue like climate change. So again, could not have one of the more kind of caricatured, dis, you know, erupted kind of discussion for the last several years. But the conversation was starting to shift four or five years ago away from the science and towards the conclusions. You know, just as an aside, when you know Barack Obama was president, it was just too delicious for Republicans to question the climate science because it just made all the progressives' heads explode. Once Donald Trump became president and actively expressed disdain for climate science, it was no longer that fun. And I think you started to see a number of Republicans wanting to differentiate themselves from what seemed to be a position that was out of step with the broad national and international community. And the place where there was kind of resonance was around investments and innovation. There's an argument still about what's the right role in terms of government putting you know, taxes on the system or regulatory caps, but both conservatives and progressives agree that we have to accelerate technology innovation or we won't have the tools to achieve those goals. And we worked for years with the, the leaders of the Senate Energy Committee and you know, towards the end of uh, last year, Senators uh, at the time Murkowski and Manchin passed legislation it was a compilation of 30 different bipartisan bills that they had worked with the broader membership of the committee on. And it was the most consequential piece of climate legislation uh, in a decade, which nobody bothered to talk about because it was in the middle of the election season and there were just far more exciting, disruptive controversies to, uh, to engage. And so, you know, there's real potential still to move forward. You know, people call them medium-sized issues, but they're medium-sized issues that affect millions of lives. You know, the, the farm bill which is also the legislation where we decide how to deal with our nutrition and hunger programs in the country. You know, that is a you know, medium-sized piece of legislation that will start to move forward next year and I think could in fact be passed through the, the regular order process. And I wonder if you agree with me that there are structural limits to bipartisanship. You experienced them, I imagine, there at the Bipartisan sure. Policy Center and I certainly experienced them at the Common Ground Initiative at the Hauenstein Center. Aren't there some issues that will not lend themselves to bipartisanship, no matter how hard we're working at it? For example, I'm thinking of issues like abortion and euthanasia. And what so, do you say? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, facts are necessary, but not sufficient to you know, resolving an issue like that um, or any kind of policy issue. And when you're addressing issues that come from a fundamentally kind of religious basis, you're not really able to have a constructive collision of facts because people's positions are really driven by kind of just a more core belief system that is almost by definition beyond that kind of scrutiny. And so we do find it very difficult to advance those discussions. Um, at the same time, you know, the vast majority of issues actually are anchored in religion. And even on some of those issues, I mean, I think there's a very interesting possibility right now looking at the opportunity to bring kind of LGBTQ rights together with religious freedom. And the state of Utah put together a very interesting compromise. And there's actually quite a bit of bipartisan interest on that question on the Hill. So, you know, it's a target rich environment for big problems. I think we do spend probably more of our time these days trying to protect issues from becoming partisan than trying to take issues that are already so fundamentally broken and putting them back together. Well, in a lot of our work, Jason, I think has to do with relationships. It's making sure those relationships are strong and growing. And, you know, speaking of relationships, I'm privileged to participate in about one week with you in the Bipartisan Policy Center. Your, your American Congressional Exchange was launched about six months ago, I think. And mm. we're, we're really privileged that we're going to be hosting you when Representative Angie Craig from Minnesota's second congressional district comes to visit Representative Peter Meyer here in Michigan's third congressional district, uh, Jerry Ford's old fifth district. Tell us how the program works and what people on Capitol Hill are saying about it. Yeah, well, so thank you for that uh, plug opportunity. And we are really looking forward to next week. You know, going back to something that you know, I mentioned just at the very outset, you know, one of the main reasons that we have such a dysfunctional partisanship as opposed to the constructive partisanship of you know, the prior 30 years you know, when President Ford was leading the Republican Party in the House um, is because the members don't know each other. And that's not you know, just across the aisle, it's even among 
the caucus. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons that are, you know, coincidental and some that are purposeful. You know, I think the fact that members now, because of all the fundraising pressures, um, are flying back and forth, you know, we're basically trying to govern on Wednesdays, right? Members of Congress generally come in Tuesday nights, leave Thursday mornings. There is this sense of getting out of DC being a politically popular instinct. Kind of remarkable to me that you know, people don't want their members of Congress to actually go do their jobs. Um, when you add to that the fact that leadership, you know, in the mid 90s realized that, you know, if the members didn't know each other, then they couldn't go around leadership. It really was a way of kind of coalescing authority to keep, the, you know, it's almost like a real estate agent never wanting the two parties to talk to one another. And so a lot of the traditions that used to bring the co Congress together, you know, joint caucus meetings, a cafeteria where everyone went and ate together, like those were all with intention um, undone. And so I think we started to realize that, you know, while this was uh, an incremental approach, helping members of Congress actually spend time together was one of the most meaningful things we could do. Um, we've actually been doing this for a couple of years. We've done probably about three dozen trips. Um, one member will host their peer for a weekend or a couple of days during the week, and then they will reciprocate. It's been a pretty, um, you know, uplifting experience because we have found that, again, these are not just moderates taking these trips. I mean, we have some of the most conservative and progressive members wanting to actually get to know each other. Um, Derek Kilmer, who uh, is a really very constructive member from the uh, Olympic Peninsula in Washington, on one of the first trips said, look, if you want to know where someone's coming from, it really helps know where they come from. And just appreciate the different constituent pressures and the different industry and economic pressures. And so you know, what we have found is often it's members on the same committee. You know, some of these committees have 50 or 60 people. So oftentimes it's members on the same committee who want to come together. There's usually a shared premise. They're interested in coastal issues or energy issues or education issues. And they will kind of design a trip with that thought in mind. The most important thing they do is they probably change, you know, they exchange texts. And so there's that kind of the WTF text, which happens a lot. Like, you know, really, what are your colleagues thinking? is a conversation that we've now told happens a lot. Uh, one or two of them have joined each other's fantasy football leagues, which I think is actually um, a profound accomplishment. They're starting to come back to Washington and think about ways they can legislate together. And so it is a, um, it is a step in the right direction. You know, we're obviously eager to figure out how to make this happen for all members of Congress, not just those who strips we can curate. And so there's some thought about that. But you know, members of Congress don't take a lot of trips anymore partly because the public has come in the post Abramoff world to think of them as, as junkets. And not only would it be nice for members of Congress to actually know a little bit about the world, it is the 15 hour flight to Kazakhstan where you actually start to appreciate you know, the issues and interests of a colleague. And so it is a, it is a ground up approach to strengthening Congress. You know, Peter Meyer and Angie Craig are, are a great duo. And I think we're really looking forward to the conversations we get to have with you at the Ford Library. Well, we're sure excited and what a great program. Hats off to you. you. Well, you just referred to it, Jason, but after World War II, you know, we Americans lived in what historians call an age of consensus. And mm -hmm. then in the late 1960s and early 1970s, politics changed pretty dramatically because of the lies surrounding Vietnam and Watergate, which deeply wounded our body politic. Now, Republicans at that time were in the minority, as you know, and they had to, to seek common ground with the majority. And, and then House uh, minority leader Ford uh, from 1965 to 1973 was playing a big role in that effort. Uh, are there very many Jerry Fords on Capitol Hill today? Not who get reelected. <laughs> right? And I think, you know, just to, to your point, one of our, you know, our organization was founded with the help of four former Senate majority leaders, Bob Dole, Howard Baker, George Mitchell, and Tom Daschle. And I remember asking Howard Baker at some point, you know, he has now since passed, um, you know, Senator, what, what was it that was really different when you, know, you were in Congress? And without even a step, he said, you know, we all fought in the war together. That there was a traumatic shared experience that just gave people a sense of connection to one another, a connection to the country. And, you know, of course, the answer to our partisanship is not to start a you know, third world war, right? We have to find other approaches that create that same sense of shared mission. Um, but to your question about, you know, where are the leaders like uh, former President Ford, there are very few districts 
in the country where the incumbent member is concerned about running in the general election. In the majority of districts in the country, the incumbent member is worried about a challenge in the primary from someone generally to their farther left or farther right. And so that really just creates an environment that discourages people from that kind of um, you know, collaborative courage. Now, it's not all the country, right? I mean, the House shifts back and forth every couple of years because those 35, 40 seats in the middle are the majority makers. Those are the decisive seats. Um, and just as an aside, I mean, the, the kind of dramatic you know, rift right now in the Democratic Party is really informed by the fact that you know, while you have the energy coming from the base, you have the people who really are keeping the gavel with the Democrats in the middle. And so, you know, the, the folks who might want to Thelma and Louise the car over the cliff have the convenient fact that they're not sitting in the car. And that's what is, I think, really kind of stimulating this debate about, you know, how the Democrats should come down on these big reconciliation-based investments and infrastructure and the rest. That's so perceptive. I and mean, Biden's legislative agenda right now is, as, I think, ambitious as FDR's New Deal or LBJ's Great Society. But you know, his uh, support in both chambers is razor thin. Yeah, yeah the it's Democratic. A, it's a, pardon. It's a great insight. I mean, everyone, you know, all of my progressive friends love this analogy to FDR. It's the FDR moment. You have a crisis, and a uh, FDR had seventy-eight senators of his party, I believe, and they were only about 95, and I can't even remember, like, you know, he was acting like he had a mandate, and he had a mandate. <laughs> what is, I think, the challenge right now for President Biden is he is acting like he has that same kind of decisive mandate, and he just does it. And again, this is, a, this is not unique to President Biden. I think the um, you know, every time you have a close election, whoever wins exaggerates their mandate. Um, usually there's a little cooling off period. We did not have that cooling off period because of the crisis and tragedy of the pandemic and the need for urgent response. And so, you know, the Biden agenda was forced forward with the combination of external urgency and the kind of, you know, our way or no way exuberance of his democratic base. And you know, they've now set expectations that are somewhat unrealistic. And, and you know, I think politically they will suffer for that somewhat. I mean, I think the fact that you know, it looks like we are going to sometime this year pass a $1 trillion infrastructure investment and a probably around $1.7, $2 trillion you know, human infrastructure. So, you know, probably close to a $3 trillion investment in kind of core democratic priorities. And people are going to say, oh, that's too bad. It wasn't $7 trillion? I mean, it's, it's a, it is the largest investment outside of the kind of exigent emergency that the country has ever made. It's going to do you know, very significant things. Um, but because they created an expectation that I think was unhinged from their actual political power, you know, they're now going to be kind of apologizing for only spending $3 trillion. Do you think this is a moment when moderates can reassert themselves or that people who are sort of on the in the bell curve on the edge between moderate and being a little bit more extremist in their party will see the prudence of coming back to a center? So the math is interesting um, because these majorities are as close as they've ever been in history, right? It's a 50-50 dead heat in the Senate and basically kind of a three vote margin in the House, you know, in the Senate, that means, you know, every single Senator is the decision maker, which of course they all think all the time. So this just reinforces their own kind of you know, ego-based premise. But as we have seen, you know, Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, who are the lead voices on this are basically understood to be, you know, a limiting factor on legislative possibility. Now, what's unspoken is there's another eight or 10 moderate Democrats kind of happy to hide behind them. And so, you know, it is not really the case that it's just mansion and cinema. Um, in the House, we saw, um, you know, basically 10 moderates for the first time in a long time not cave in. And at least for you know, quite a while say, you know, we are not going to support moving forward on the much bigger piece until we can advance this infrastructure legislation that's already been passed the Senate with a bipartisan vote. So that it's so this, you know, the challenge now is um, 
much more engaged than it has been in the past. Success breeds success. And so, you know, a lot will depend on what comes out here in the next, you know, four or five weeks. I think if we actually see a effective bipartisan infrastructure bill pass and a scaled down reconciliation package that focuses more on the issues that historically have enjoyed bipartisan support. I mean, there's a lot in that reconciliation package that if it was not being done through this process would actually have a broader set of uh, supporters, paid leave, childcare, technology investment, some, some, some of the Medicare and Medicaid work. Um, so if that is a success, I think you will then see the moderates start to feel like, you know, hey, we actually can make a difference and uh, winning is fun and it's worth, you know, it's worth the risk. Maybe just one of my, maybe closing thoughts is, you know, one of the most pernicious aspects of the failing of our democracy is the sense of why bother? You know, the, it's hard to compromise. There's a political cost, there's an intellectual cost. And if you feel like you're never going to win, it just creates a you know, lessening sense of expectations and possibility. And so you know, this infrastructure bill is a big deal. If that gets done, I think it does create a predicate that will encourage more people to be ambitious in actually governing a divided country. I've got to ask you, if you were to create a case study, uh, now you mentioned climate change earlier, but if you were to take another topic and create a case study of what successful you know, negotiations in Congress look like, what is your model? for what Congress should be doing? What do you say when, when a new Senator or somebody in the House of Representatives comes in, they say, Jason, what, what should we be studying for what we should do? What do you point to? So, you know, when I try to describe what the Bipartisan Policy Center is, you know, the classic you know, Thanksgiving distant cousin conversation, you know, I often say that we are basically trying to recreate the role that congressional committees used to play when they were the engines of the democracy. I mean, the, the Congressional Committee used to be the platform where you know, people with partisan interests, interests, but kind of also shared substantive interests would work through differing versions of the facts and generate some kind of basis of consensus. And then upon that you know, fact-based consensus, develop a policy solution. That process very rarely happens within the Congress anymore. And so you know, what we often try to do is you know, kind of create, you know, third party expressions of that same process by bringing together a very diverse group of experts, some with ideological points of view, some with strong economic interests, some who are you know, issue experts, and go through the laborious task of actually developing a shared set of facts, which is a political process. And then based on those shared understandings, start to think about solutions. I think that is the only process that gets people to bridge complicated differences. Um, most Congressional legislation is largely developed outside of Capitol Hill. The Congress just does not have the staff capacity anymore to really, on most issues, be leading these discussions from the ground up. And so I think from a you know, member of Congress asking that question, you know, I would basically be arguing to really try to build relationships on your committee and to be looking to not just the Bipartisan Policy Center, but you know, other organizations that are trying to combine rigorous analysis with some political viability and use the committee to develop those proposals. You know, we very rarely have actual debates on the floor of Congress. The committee process sometimes is still a place where those discussions really take place. And so I think, you know, that is the, that is the generative design of the institution. Um, so I think that's where we would place our emphasis. Interesting. Well, and, and that's been your approach for, what, 15 years at the Bipartisan Policy Center, yeah, right? Yeah, we, uh, we stumbled in about 15 years ago. Yeah. And so you're, you're chalking up some great successes. What do the next 15 years look like for you? I, was, you know, I should lie down for this. Um, you know, look, our ambition is to have the Congress work better some of the time. You know, it is not to imagine a perfectly functional institution. Um, like, you know, again, our process was designed to be difficult. And the benefit of that was that the outcomes were therefore thought to be durable. And so I think that the, you know, premise of our work is to try to help members of Congress create more these durable solutions. You know, the challenges we face are structural. 
we're not going to solve climate change if every two years the policy is shifting back and forth because no one will make investments that are of a magnitude to matter. And so you know, I think we don't want to be you know, hope as a strategy, but I think that you know, in 15 years from now, if we could see some power shifting back to the committees, a lot of the problem is that leadership has absconded with all the authority and leadership is more political, right? Their mandate is to be in leadership. Whereas when the committees and the chairs of those committees had more authority, you saw more substantive kind of agenda coming forward. So I think we'd like to see that happen. We'd like to see the, you know, just some of these fundamental structural challenges to our democracy um, be worked on. So, you know, obviously there's climate change, but the whole premise of this country that if you work hard, you will be able to get ahead and give your kids a better future. It's not true for a lot of people. And I think that, you know, we have to address, like, if you wonder where the anger is coming from, I mean, President Trump clearly tapped into, and I think in many ways amplified a sense of victimization and frustration that millions of people are feeling. But millions of people are feeling victimization and frustration. And so it's not appropriate as some of my friends want to do to just say, oh, well, President Trump created that. I think he's recognized it and saw it as a, you know, opportunity for really generating a lot of political momentum and power. Um, but we've got to really address the underlying premise that you know, folks don't think they can send their kids to college and um, you know, make sure that if not for everybody, at least for most people, you know, they actually have a shot to work hard and get ahead. And I don't want to end this, this webcast podcast without mentioning that you wrote a book, City of Rivals, Restoring the Glorious Mess of American Democracy. I got to ask you, since we're talking about the next 15 years, do you have another book in you? So this, you know, it was a very fortunate that my wife suggested I write the book because then for the next three years, when I went down to the basement and left her with the kids, you know, I reminded her it was her idea. Um, we made it through. Um, just got my first kid into college. And so, you know, I think that there will be a moment uh, when I'm no longer spending most of my afternoons on soccer sidelines that uh, I may give it another shot. But as you know, it's an excruciating, it's a tough, pro I enjoyed it, but it's an excruciating process, especially if you're trying to find little gaps in your life. I will remember sadly that, you know, I used to be very excited if I had a six hour layover in an airport because there was an opportunity to, you know, work on the book and that's not a way to live a life. So, um, so that's a definite maybe. Okay, well. I tell you, you're doing such great work in so many different areas. If I encourage people to go to the website of the Bipartisan Policy Center because you're going to see a lot of issues and a very, uh, I think, rational, centrist, analytical, but hopeful way of tackling those problems. Jason Grubay, thank you for being our thoughtful guest today. You, along with your team at the Bipartisan Policy Center, have helped us look past our dysfunctional democracy and have given us hope for better days ahead from the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. This is Gleaves Whitney exploring the question. Thank you.